webinar uh, yang nanti akan membahas terkait dengan lesson for school of health around epidemic preparedness, uh, around epidemic preparedness, and then uh, saya kira nanti diskusinya akan sangat nyambung dengan kita seperti uh, gitu ya uh, Indonesia sebagai negara berkembang karena nanti untuk epidemic preparedness yang dibahas adalah uh, apa namanya dalam di konteks uh, apa namanya, di konteks negara berkembang juga seperti itu jadi meskipun negaranya berbeda saya harap nanti ada banyak uh, pelajaran terkait dengan uh, epidemic preparedness yang bisa kita ambil seperti itu. Oke, okay, uh, untuk acara kita uh, pada pagi hari ini akan kita mulai dengan uh, menyanyikan lagu Indonesia Raya, kemudian Mars dan juga himne uh, kepada uh, apa kepada seluruh peserta harap uh, mendengarkan dan bersikap dengan sempurna. Terima kasih. Jangan lupa 
Agenda berikutnya adalah uh, pembukaan uh, oleh Wakil Rektor 4 kita, uh, Bu Novita Ana Anggra ini, Eskep Nurse MKEP. And the, so the next agenda will be opening speech from our fourth Vice Chancellor uh, to Miss Novita. Now it's your turn. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Uh, suara saya sudah terdengar? Ya, yeah, clearly. Oke. Okay. Oke, okay, thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning for all participants. Hi, how are you, Carrie? Uh, hope today is amazing day. We can invite you in our campus. Thanks for attending. Because lecture with Dr. Kerry Ubel in the topic about household schools of health respond to the future threat. And Kerry from UNSW. Honorable for Rector IIK Strada Indonesia, Prof. Sandu, and then our lecturer and student of IIK Strada Indonesia. The participant in this webinar lecturer and then student, student from diploma, bachelor and master program. And I say once again, thank you, Kerry, you have time for sharing with our campus. That uh, I'm very appreciate. I hope we can continue about this agenda because uh, I think that is very important to, to improve our knowledge. And maybe a, a bit about IIK Strada. You know, Kerry, uh, our, our campus, IIK Strada Indonesia, one of a private campus in Asia, especially in East Java. Uh, hope after pandemic, you can come to Indonesia. And we have, we have three faculty and 12 program study, diplom, bachelor, profession and master program, uh, nursing, public health, midwifery, pharmacy, 
Master of Public Health, Master of Nursing, and so on, and uh, the all program study which focus in health science. And then uh, if we have opportunity, we can visit to UNSW for benchmarking, uh, student exchange, maybe we can also can join research. And thanks again for attend biggest lecture in IIG Radha Indonesia, Kerry, and I hope with sharing we can to improve the quality of education in, in Indonesia. Thank you very much and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for the welcome. Okay. Uh, Oke, okay, so agenda berikutnya adalah acara utama yaitu presentasi dilanjutkan dengan diskusi oleh Dr. Kerry Webel. So, uh, hello Kerry, how are you? Yes, Reza, it's lovely to see you again. I am well, thank you very much. <laughs> so, so are you doing well in this pandemic? Uh, yes, as you can see from my background, I'm at home and I'm teaching um, from at home like I'm sure many of you have. Um, okay. Australia is very fortunate to have very little transmission at the moment, but um, we all know how okay. difficult this disease has been this year. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I think I have to say that now we Indonesia, like like the COVID-19 pandemic is become very huge problem. So like the new cases in here in Indonesia is I think like 8,000 new cases in a day. And then, and then like we have a uh, very low test rate. So yeah, you know, because of the in infrastructure and then the and then the PCR test is, 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 is not really affordable for us, but yeah, but uh, I'm happy we're still doing well. Okay, uh, Kerry, so uh, now is your time to present uh, about the lesson for the school of health around epidemic preparedness. Uh, uh, hopefully it will uh, increase uh, I think it will be increase our knowledge, of course, uh, in uh, epidemic preparedness, especially for our context as developing countries. Okay, Kari, now it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will try and send my, uh, share my screen. I did send my slides separately to you. So in case I'm struggling to share the screen, perhaps someone can do that for me, but let's try. Um, I'm struggling with that. I have got open. No, I'm struggling to work out how to share it. Are you able to share it for me? And then I can uh, see. Should be. Wait for a second. The PowerPoints. I don't use Zoom a lot. I use another app. So This one, right? Ah, oh, brilliant. Okay. So maybe just put okay. that on, um, on a screen uh, slideshow. Fantastic. Okay. So, so just say next to me uh, <laughs> if, if, if you need to move to another slide. All right. Thank you. Please. Okay. So I, I was asked to speak about lessons for schools of health around epidemic preparedness, particularly in developing countries. So my name is Dr. Kerry Yubel. Um, I'm currently a senior lecturer in the School of Population Health at the University of New South Wales. If we could have the next slide. So what I want to talk about today, I want to talk about my experience um, because I think that's the thing I know the most about. And I worked for many years in South Africa and South Africa is also a developing country, as you know. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit briefly about the broad context in South Africa. Then I want to go in and talk about the HIV epidemic in South Africa. Secondly, I want to then identify what I think were some of the critical health service strategies to tackle HIV in South Africa. And from there, go and draw what I think are the lessons for schools of health in developing countries. If we can go to the next one. All right, so to give you some ideas of the South African context, I worked in South Africa from 1983. That was just two years after I'd qualified as a doctor in Australia. And I worked until the year 2017 as a primary care doctor. Um, so I am actually mostly a clinician. I'm currently working in academia, but most of my experience is as a clinician. 
As many of you will know, South Africa is described as an upper middle income developing country, according to the World Bank. And like many developing countries, there are very large differences or disparities in income, in health, in education and in service provision between the rich and the poor, and especially in South Africa across racial lines. And a lot of this is the legacy of a, a policy of apartheid, a very racist policy that was in place in South Africa from 1948 until 1992. South Africa has an extensive, well-established health and education infrastructure, but there are large disparities again. So there is a distinctly distinct separation between the private and the public health services. So the private health sector is very well staffed, very well resourced, and they do that through private health insurance. And something like 10 to 15% of the population are able to, uh, to afford health insurance or are able to pay cash to access services in the private health sector. The public sector, on the other hand, is providing services for between 85 and 90% of the population, but is in contrast poorly staffed, in many cases poorly run and poorly resourced. However, since the end of apartheid and the new government in South Africa in 1994, there have been significant developments and um, investment in the public sector, particularly providing primary health services and the establishment of a lot of primary health care clinics across the country. Similarly, in schooling, there's a separate private schooling system and a public schooling system, and that applies to primary schools and secondary schools. However, there's not a well-developed private tertiary system. Most of the tertiary education facilities are public, they are fee paying, however, the fees are quite expensive. And again, there are large disparities between the richer, traditionally white universities under apartheid and the poorer black universities, again, that were established under apartheid. Although there's been a lot more funding of the poorer universities, the disparities still exist. So next slide, please. In 2009, there was a series of articles published in The Lancet um, having a look at the South African system. And one of the things that they described there, I think, is a useful concept that I think is applicable to quite a number of developing countries. And that is that South African uh, health context is dealing with what they call a quadruple burden of disease. So four major disease burdens in the South African context. The first is those of infectious diseases. And this is, this is unlike developed countries where infectious diseases are not a great burden. This is one of the great burdens. And the particular diseases in South Africa are tuberculosis and HIV. There are pockets in South Africa with malaria, but it is not a widespread problem. There are problems with hepatitis B and various diarrheal diseases. The second major disease burden in South Africa is maternal and perinatal diseases. And these diseases are particularly because of problems accessing skilled maternal health services and skilled perinatal health services. The third burden of disease, and again, this is common in a lot of developing countries, is the increasing number of people suffering from non-communicable diseases. These were classically thought to be the Western diseases of rich nations, but it's become increasingly clear over the last 25 years that this is a rising burden in developing countries as well. And those are diseases like hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Many of those are rising from an epidemic of obesity, but also chronic lung diseases, and I think the two factors in developing countries that are contributing to chronic lung diseases are things like air pollution and high rates of smoking. And the last one, of course, of the communicable, non-communicable diseases are the various cancers. 
And the fourth burden of disease that was identified as a real burden in South Africa was trauma. And there are two major sources of trauma in South Africa, that is interpersonal trauma. Um, and this is often related to a very large level of alcohol consumption in South Africa. And the other type of trauma, and again, I think this is fairly common in a number of developing countries, is trauma and injuries arising from motor vehicle accidents. So road accidents, both, uh, both injuries and deaths. And here in South Africa, alcohol does is one of the contributing factors. But there, of course, are others, including poor maintenance of vehicles, poor implementation of rules around speeding. So that's what we call the quadruple burden of disease in the South African context. Can we go to the next slide? So what I wanted to talk about now is the HIV epidemic in South Africa. As you know, this is an infectious disease that has been um, really prominent since the 90s across the world. It hasn't hit us as quickly as COVID-19 has, but it, there are many lessons for how a country responds to an particularly uh, an infectious disease epidemic. Now, the HIV epidemic in South Africa spiraled out of control in the 1990s and the 2000s, despite some really good surveillance. So, for instance, we noted in the 1990s rapidly rising HIV prevalence, and one of the ways that that was tracked in South Africa was through an annual anonymous HIV surveillance amongst women booking at public antenatal clinics. So this HIV surveillance um, was done every year from about 1989, if I recall. Every year they would monitor what percentage of women booking at public clinics, antenatal clinics in uh, South Africa uh, were coming up as HIV positive. So that was the first way that we were able to monitor increasing prevalence in the 1990s. The second thing uh, that happened uh, was that we noted rapidly rising deaths in the early 2000s. And we mapped that, that was mapped by Stats South Africa, a very good health in, uh, infrastructure uh, to look at um, national epidemiological trends. And they noted increasing excess deaths. And those excess deaths went up to over 300,000 by the mid 2000s. So very good surveillance, but the epidemic was spiraling out of control. Next slide. So by 2004, 2005, South Africa had the largest HIV burden in the world, estimated at 5.2 million people living with HIV in South Africa at the time, the prevalence amongst adults between 15 and 49 years old was noted at that stage to be about 16.9%, a huge burden. As a result of the HIV epidemic coming on a long history of TB, we had an exploding TB epidemic. The incidence of, T of new cases of TB went over 1,000 per 100,000 per year by about 2004, 2005, and that was the second highest incidence rates in the world. The highest at that stage was in Lesotho, which is a small mountainous kingdom, kingdom surrounded completely by South Africa. It was also noted to be a very high infant mortality rate of 48.7 per thousand births. Decreasing life expectancy went down to 53.8 years. And as I said, I've mentioned already, the death rate nearly doubled. So by 2005-ish, 47.2% of all deaths in South Africa were AIDS-related. The hospitals were overwhelmed with patients dying of HIV plus or minus tuberculosis and no effective treatment available for HIV in South Africa in the public sector. The antenatal prevalence survey showed that the prevalence among pregnant women booking in public facilities had reached as high as 31%. And nearly half of all maternal deaths were thought to be due to AIDS, truly a pandemic with devastating impact in South Africa by then. Next slide. 
So South Africa started with a national public antiretroviral treatment rollout in late 2004. Now, this was significantly delayed. South Africa should have been in a position to start this in 2000 or 2001, as did one of our neighbours, Botswana. But there were significant delays in South Africa due to political resistance from the ruling party. So the president at the time, the health minister at the time, and various other senior ANC members uh, were starting to believe um, teachings from what we call AIDS denialists, and they were essentially saying that HIV was not the cause of AIDS, and AIDS, the sickness, was actually caused by poverty and poor nutrition. And along with that, they were teaching that antiretrovirals were imported European toxins. Now, as you can imagine, this was very, very difficult to see so many people dying and to have this level of denialism and obstruction from leading members of the government. And that led to considerable mobilization of civil society to push for an antiretroviral rollout. So eventually, in the midst of all of this pressure, they started with a public antiretroviral rollout in late 2004. Can we just hit the next button? Good. So what happened as a result of that rollout? By 2020, 15 years into the rollout, South Africa currently still has the largest burden of HIV in the world. There are now seven and a half million people living with HIV. Adult prevalence amongst 15 to 49 year olds has gone up to 19% and a staggering 25% of women in the age group 15 to 49 are HIV positive. Now at first glance, because those numbers have gone up, it looks like the rollout didn't actually have an effect, an impact. But actually, because of the rollout, more people survived. And so the number of people living with HIV instead of dying with HIV has gone up. And we can see that in some of the figures with TB. Can you um, press the next button, advance again? So what we've seen since then is that TB incidence has decreased significantly from over 1,000 per 100,000 down to 615 per 100,000. It is still high. It's still the second highest rate in the world. And if you compare with the rate in Indonesia that I looked up from the um, UN uh, Global TB report, stated that Indonesian incidence was around 312 per 100,000. So there is still a problem with TB in South Africa, but we've dropped the incidence down significantly with the rollout. And the other way to look at the success of the rollout is that currently it's an estimated 5,277,000 people are accessing ARVs in South Africa out of those 7.5 estimated to be living with HIV. That's a huge achievement over 15 years to get over 5 million people accessing ARVs. Next slide. So the next thing I want to go, so having looked at the HIV stats in South Africa, I want to try and identify some of the critical health service strategies to tackle HIV. If you could press the advance button. And the question that I want to ask is, how did South Africa succeed in getting over 5 million people on ARVs in the public sector, given the poor resourcing, given the poor staffing, given some health facilities that were badly run? So what I'm going to do is to look at the details of a trial that was one, run in one of the provinces of South Africa, and this trial aimed at increasing access to ARVs. And this was called the STRETCH trial. This was a pragmatic, randomized, controlled trial that was run in all of the ARV clinics in the Free State province, which is a province in the middle of South Africa. And this trial was run between 2007 and 2010. And this trial had two main interventions. The two main interventions were task shifting and integration of HIV care into primary care services. Now, I was appointed in the Free State as the, as the program manager of this trial, so I know a lot of the details of this trial. Can we go to the next slide? All right, again, so give you some context for the Free State. The Free State province in 2005, 
as I said, is, is, is in the middle of South Africa. It's predominantly a rural province. It's one of the poorer provinces in South Africa. Population at the time was approximately 2.8 million, and the main industries were agriculture and mining. And at that stage, 2005, there was an estimated 360,000 people living with HIV in the province. The prevalence was estimated at 18.5% uh, in 15 to 49-year-olds, and that was the third highest prevalence amongst all the provinces in South Africa. In the Free State province, the public health system was very short of doctors, especially in primary care clinics. There was an extensive network of primary care clinics across the province. It was about 200 clinics, and the majority of these primary care clinics were run primarily by primary care nurses. And these primary care nurses were managing chronic disease care. They were managing maternal and child health, and they were managing TB diagnosis and treatment. Next slide. So in the free state, the ARV rollout, the initial phase was between 2005 and 2007. It was a very cautious beginning. But by 2007, they had only established 11 primary care clinics that were designated as ARV treatment sites. And these 11 ARV treatment sites were the only ones that had an ARV trained doctor to initiate and do six monthly repeat ARV prescriptions. Patients who'd been started on ARVs could get their monthly ARV supplies at any one of 31 nurse-run ARV designated clinics. So out of the 200 or so clinics, only 15% were clinics where patients could actually access their ARVs once they were started. So if you were diagnosed with HIV, you had to travel to one of these 11 clinics to get the doctor's prescription. And then you had to travel to one of the 31 clinics to get your monthly supplies of ARVs. Hospital doctors were not allowed to prescribe ARVs. They had to refer their patients to one of these 11 clinics. And by the end of 2007, only 9,000 patients had been initiated on ARVs. Remember, there were 360,000 patients in the province who were known to be infected. And the clinics were already full. Next slide. All right, so the Free State Department of Health was very concerned about how they could increase access to ARVs. So the department partnered with the University of Cape Town to implement the stretch trial. The reason they involved the University of Cape Town, uh, which was not in the Free State province, the University of Cape Town was, of course, in Cape Town, which is in another province, was because that, the, the people from the UCT had already piloted primary care nurse training manuals for TB care and they were prepared to include HIV and ARV care in this manual to train primary care nurses. So they set up a randomized, controlled, pragmatic trial. We involved all 31 ARV clinics, and we randomized those to 16 intervention and 15 control. We conducted training of trainers and the logistics. They were done by the research team. But the research team did not appoint any extra nurses or doctors all of the clinic work, all of the clinical work during the trial was done by existing uh, doctors and nurses in the clinics that we were working. Next slide. So I said there were two main interventions in the 16 inter intervention clinics in this trial. The first one was task shifting. Now we did quite a number of uh, task shifting jobs in this trial. The first was to shift tasks from the doctors to the ARV nurses. And what we did was we shifted ARV initiation and repeat prescription to trained ARV nurses in our 16 intervention clinics. The second lot of task shifting that we did was we shifted from pharmacists to pharmacy assistants. And again, like doctors, pharmacists were in short supply. There were pharmacists in the hospitals and some of the treatment sites, but most of the clinics did not have pharmacists but they did have pharmacy assistants. And up till the time of the trial, the pharmacy assistants were not allowed to dispense ARVs. So we did some task shifting. We shifted ARV dispensing from pharmacists to trained pharmacy assistants in the intervention clinics in primary care. And the third lot of task shifting that we did 
was we shifted from nurses to lay health workers, drug readiness training. Now, previously, it had been the responsibility of the registered nurses to train all the patients um, in how to take ARVs. We trained healthcare workers, lay healthcare workers to do these, and we did task shifting from the nurses to the lay healthcare workers so that we could free up the nurses to start managing ARVs. That was our first intervention, task shifting. The second intervention was that we integrated HIV and ARV care services into all of the primary care clinics that had been referring to these 16 ARV intervention sites. So let me explain. Of those 16 clinics that were intervention clinics, ARV clinics that were intervention clinics in our trial, many of them would have up to seven or eight surrounding primary care clinics that were not designated at ARV sites that had to send their patients every month to one of these ARV sites to get their ARVs and had to send them to treatment sites further on to be initiated. So what we did, we looked at the network of primary care clinics that were referring to these intervention sites and integrated HIV and ARV care services except initiation and six monthly repeats. So now what would happen, for instance, was the ordinary primary care clinics were allowed to do CD4 counts, whereas they had not been allowed to do so before. They were allowed to set up drug readiness training classes. They were allowed to dispense ARVs at the primary care clinic instead of the patients having to transfer into the ARV clinic. So we looked at integrating as many HIV and ARV care services into all the primary care clinics that had been referring to our 16 intervention sites. Next slide, please. A very big trial, we ran it over four years. The main result of the stretch trial, what we chose to do was to look at the outcomes, the survival, 12 month survival of patients who started at the clinic with a CD4 of less than 350 and who were not yet on antiretrovirals. Now, when we reported the main trial, we reported simply what happened in intervention versus control clinics. And very disappointingly, we saw no significant difference between intervention and control clinics. But remember, this was a pragmatic trial. We didn't put extra staff in these clinics. So all of this was done and we changed the whole system. And it was not easy to do that at a provincial level. So the integration of services got messy. It was difficult. So what we did then was we did a sub-analysis, particularly of the impact of integration into primary care services on survival. Next um, thing. And that's where we noticed the critical difference. We looked at the 12 month mortality hazard ratio for individual patients, depending on which clinic they were at. And we'd done a score for how well that clinic had managed to integrate services into their surrounding primary care clinics. And what we found was for every one point increase in integration of services into the surrounding, integration of HIV and ARV care services into the surrounding primary care care clinics, we notice a 10% 10, 10 decrease in 12 month mortality hazard ratio. Let me put that in, in simpler terms. Integration, we have shown that integration of HIV and ARV care into primary care clinics improved the survival of patients who needed ARVs. And why did it do that? Because it increased their access to care. They could access their ARVs regularly at their local clinic instead of having to transfer to a centralized ARV clinic. Next slide, please. The really gratifying thing that happened was there was a new health minister appointed at the beginning of 2010 as our trial was wrapping up. And this guy did not come from those who were AIDS denialists. This guy was a doctor who understood that it was critical to get antiretrovirals out to every South African. So when he saw the results of our trial, he took up those interventions that we had piloted in the free state, and he said he wants task shifting, training of primary care nurses in ARV initiation and, and repeat prescription, and he wants to integrate comprehensive HIV care in all primary health care clinics. And that was rolled out by the National Department of Health as national policy starting in April 2010. Now, obviously, that didn't happen overnight. 
But over the period of 2010 to 2011, it was implemented in every province, and there are nine provinces in South Africa, and in all primary care clinics across the country in that period 2010 to 2011. And what happens is if you look at population health stats over that period, there were substantial increases in ARV enrolments, substantial decreases in infant mortality rates, and substantial decreases in the death rates as a result of this policy. So I'm gonna just show you some very simple graphs to show you what happened. For the next slide, please. So this is a very simple graph that I've done from the period 2003 up till 2016. So I haven't updated it for 2017, 18, 19 as yet. But the top orange line shows the number of people living with HIV in, in uh, South Africa, going up from 5 million in about 2003 up to 7 million in 2016. And the blue line shows a rapid increase in enrollment of ARVs. So in the first few years, it was quite a slow increase. And in fact, you can see an increase in the slope around 2010, 2011, when they implemented this policy, such that by 2016, there were 4 million. And we know by the uh, beginning of this year, 5.27 million people now accessing ARVs in South Africa. The next slide. We've seen impacts, big impacts on the death rates. So if you look at the blue line, that is the total deaths in South Africa. You'll see from 2002 to 2006, steep increases as AIDS deaths started um, um, coming in up to over 700,000 in 2006. And as the national rollout started, and you can see quite a significant decrease in 2010, 2011, a massive increase in, a massive decrease in total deaths. And the orange line has showed you the estimated AIDS deaths. They were as high as 350,000 in 2005 and gone down to just over 100,000 in 2017. A massive impact on death rates. The next one. And we've even seen increased life expectancy. So the life expectancy 2005, 2006 went down to about 53.8. That's the gray line. Differences in men and women. Women um, also quite low. And as you can see by 2017, the uh, life expectancy had gone up by more than 10 years to almost 65 years. So significant impact on population level uh, data here. And I think the last one, is looking at also a significant impact by decreasing infant and child mortality rates. So the blue line is looking at infant mortality rates, almost got to 50 by 2017, just over 30, and uh, under five mortality rate, over 70, and by 2017, nearly halved. So this is just showing you some of the impact of the success of the rollout of antiretrovirals in South Africa. Can I have the next slide? So what do I think are some of the lessons for schools of health in developing countries? I think there are three critical strategies that need to be supported by schools of health in developing countries. I think there are critical strategies around human resources. And the couple that I will mention, and these are not exhaustive, but the couple that I'll mention that I think come out of what I've seen is task shifting is an important um, strategy. And supporting that is having flexible but clear policies around scope of work to support mid-level health workers. The second critical strategy is to have a strong foundation of primary care. And one of the, thing, the strategies that we saw working was you need to integrate critical services into primary care because it improves accessibility and thus it improves survival. But the other interesting thing that happens when you have a strong foundation of primary care is that you stimulate community involvement. And that is critical in a, in a whole country response to any epidemic. And the third critical strategy is how we respond from a public health point of view. And I think there are some very basic level things at a community level that are important, and that includes things like outbreak control. But there are some very sophisticated things that are very important, and that is some of your highly developed epidemiology skills that are really important when it comes to a public health response to um, epidemics. I just want to pack out some of those. Let's go to the next slide. So let's look at human resources. And I think that task shifting to mid-level health workers 
is very critical to increasing access to treatment in any community-wide epidemic, whether it be an infectious epidemic or whether it be something like a non-communicable disease. And I think I've illustrated it by the three types of task shifting that we did in the stretch trial. The one of shifting patient care from doctors to nurses. The second example that I gave was shifting drug dispensing from pharmacists to pharmacy assistants. And the third one that I gave was shifting patient education from nurses to lay health workers. And I'm sure each of you will know other mid-level health workers in your particular health sector where this type of task shifting can be done. So this is not an exhaustive list. These are just examples of the type of task shifting that can be critical to increasing access to care. But having said that, task shifting must not become task dumping. It's not a matter of saying, oh, well, we don't have enough doctors, the nurses can do it. Your mid-level health workers must be trained and supported in taking up these new tasks. And the way we need to look at it is that if you are doing task shifting, you need to increase the skills and capabilities of mid-level and community healthcare workers. And this is a huge cohort that we need to upskill. So task shifting, I think, is critical. Next slide. So how do schools of health support task shifting? I think that education of mid-level healthcare workers needs to be seen as a number one important national priority. And by the mid-level healthcare workers that I know from my South African experience and what I've seen coming back to Australia, I'm talking about registered nurses. I'm talking even about enrolled nurses who might have one or two years training. I'm talking about pharmacy assistants, I'm talking about lay health workers, but as I've said already, I'm sure that each in our own context knows mid-level health workers that would so benefit from specific targeted um, education programs from schools of health. Now, the reason that I'm emphasizing this is the training of doctors is always seen as very prestigious and very important in any developing country. And it is important, but can we go on to the next bit? We all know this, the supply of doctors in public health systems in developing countries is badly impacted by brain drain. The next button. And that is both internally to well-funded and well-functioning private sector and externally to more developed countries. And I know I saw this in South Africa. South Africa trains lots of doctors, but they are well represented in the private sector and poorly represented in the public sector. And there are good reasons for it. It's difficult to be a doctor in the public sector when it's poorly funded and poorly run. But it's not just internally that we get brain drain of doctors we get an external brain drain as well. And it's well described as being a very difficult problem in developing countries. Developing countries can have amazing system for training doctors, but if they're losing a significant number of their doctors to other countries, it's very, very difficult. So yes, every university, every would love to have a medical school. Every state, every province sees it as very prestigious to have a medical school training doctors. And I'm not saying it's not important, but what I am saying is I think we need to increase the priority, the prestige, and the importance that we place on training mid-level health workers, because these are the ones that form the bulk of our workforce in our public sector, and therefore the potential for facing any epidemics in our developing countries. Can we go to the next slide? So can I repeat it? I think that training of mid-level workers needs to be prioritized and given great prestige. What do we need to train our mid-level healthcare workers in? I think we can train them in basic primary care management of common diseases. Because if they are working with these common diseases all the time, they have the opportunity to develop expertise. So for instance, let me give you an example. I don't think there's any point in training primary care nurses in Australia to manage TB. They will never see it but there's certainly great worth 
in training mid-level nurses to manage TB in countries like Indonesia or South Africa, where TB is a common problem. I think we need to train our mid-level workers in the management of these common diseases. And I think this needs to happen at both the undergraduate level and at the postgraduate level. In full-time courses, one-year courses, two-year courses. But if we're going to train our mid-level healthcare workers that are currently in the workforce, we've got to look at other modes of training. So I would like to flag the importance of ongoing in-service training in short modules to equip them to respond to changing health needs in the case of epidemics. So again, I think this is a very important area that schools of health need to look at. How can we improve the undergraduate course so that they are getting training in primary care management of common diseases? How can we increase, include this in our postgraduate courses? But how can we do this in short modules, in service, in place, in the hospitals, in the clinics where our mid-level healthcare workers are working so we can upskill them while they're working? Next slide. To back this up, we need to look at flexible, clear policies on scope of work. Now, the reason that I say this is because in the midst of implementing the stretch trial, in the free strat. We faced lots of barriers, partly because of senior people in the National Department of Health that were obstructing us in getting nurses to prescribe antiretrovirals. And they kept sending messages to say, prescribing of antiretrovirals is beyond the scope of work of a registered nurse. It's a doctor's duty. Doctors, nurses should not be doing this. Nurses do not have the expertise to do this. We even had one instance where a senior National Department of Health official walked into one of our intervention clinics in a rural town in the Free State and told our nurses that were prescribing ARVs that they would be brought before the nursing council and sanctioned and disciplined because they were acting outside their scope of work. We had to do a lot of work with the National Department of Health and supporting our nurses and pointing out that what they were doing was legal. But you see, you need to have policies on scope of work when you're working with mid-level healthcare workers because they need to be backed up. They need to be supported that whatever tasks you're asking them to do, that is within their scope of work. But these policies also need to be flexible. And they need to respond to changing health needs in the country. Otherwise, they become a threat, like they did to some of our nurses who felt unsure of whether they could prescribe ARVs by being told by people with a different agenda that they were acting beyond their scope of work. So remember, the scope of work for mid-level healthcare workers depends on two things. It depends on their training, but it also depends on your patterns of disease. And if your patterns of disease are training, uh, patterns of disease are changing in your healthcare environment, you need to offer training to mid-level healthcare workers and you need to change their scope of, of work so that they are backed up in managing these diseases. So how do schools of health support policies on scope of work for, for mid-level health workers? Scope of work policies can and should be altered depending on what are the prevalent disease patterns. And schools of health have a critical position here in working with national bodies like nursing councils, uh, regulatory bodies, to regularly review scope of work and to be able to back it up by saying, these are all our training courses. So schools of health can and should back up these uh, uh, scope of work policies with training courses in the management of prevalent and emerging diseases. Next slide. So those are the things I wanted to say about human resources. They are only two things that is not exhaustive. But those are the things that came out of, of my experience with this stretch trial. The second thing that I think is a critical strategy is you need to have a strong foundation in primary care. So as I think you've seen, the integration of HIV care into primary care in South Africa had huge benefits, not just around improving accessibility to care, although it did that. It meant that people could go to their local primary health care clinic and get onto ARVs and get their ARVs every month. That would improve adherence as well. But also, one of the consequences of integrating HIV care was you increased massively the health workforce that was available to manage HIV care. Not only that, you improved holistic care. 
because patients will now access their TB treatment and their hypertension treatment and their HIV treatment, all from one skilled primary care nurse who could provide holistic care. Another of the advantages of integrating this care into primary care services was we actually started to normalize HIV. Before this, it had been very stigmatized. You had to go to a special ARV clinic. It became a huge emotional burden for people to actually go and get tested and go and get treatment. Because you could get your HIV treatment at the local clinic, it was less stigmatized. Now, not every infectious disease has the same amount of stigma, but we've seen stigma with COVID. If your services are available in all of your primary care clinics, it normalizes them, decreases stigma, increases access. But not only does it do that, what happened was when we put HIV care into the local primary care clinics, it improved community involvement. Because you know what? The community could see the nurse that was prescribing the treatment. They could see you could go into the clinic sick and three months later, you were better. And what happened was they thought, this is our clinic. And this is our nurses that are helping our people. And that was a tremendous boost to the community. And I remember during this trial, I was traveling all over the free state for about four years. And I probably got to know the nurses in more than 100 clinics across that province. And I can distinctly remember going into many clinics that had not had access to ARVs before. And I would walk into that clinic and the sister would say to me, wow, I didn't think I could provide ARVs, but now I can give ARVs to our cousins and our aunties and our grannies and my sister, and I feel empowered. And the community could see that. They could see, they could see the positive benefits of treatment. You got improved buy-in to infection control, improved buy-in to adherence, improved buy-in to things like contact tracing. These are some of the benefits of concentrating on primary care. Next slide. So how do schools of health support primary care? Well, again, I think schools of health need to emphasize training of mid-level workers in the management of common community health problems so that they're able to do this when they're allocated to primary care. So what are some of the common community problems in developing countries that can be managed at a primary care level? Basic maternal and perinatal care. So how can schools of health contribute there? Can we train advanced midwives to work in primary care? Can we provide basic training to birthing attendants, traditional birthing attendants, in simple, safe antenatal and birthing care? Can we provide training in the management of infectious diseases, depending on which ones are most prevalent in our communities? TB is the big one. We can train nurses in TB management, but we can also train TB lay workers in simple things like uh, adherence to TB treatment, education about common side effects, but we can also train our mid-level workers in the management of non-communicable diseases and aim to have nurse management of diseases like hypertension, diabetes, cervical cancer screening. But more than that, we can, or schools of health, I think, need to be involved in developing simple management algorithms. Because if you're going to get registered nurses and enrolled nurses involved in managing something like hypertension, you don't, have to, you don't need to have a bewildering array of 16 different possible antihypertensive medications that they can choose from. You need to have a simple step-by-step -step approach to assessing hypertension, when to start treatment, which is the best drugs to start treatment on. And you need to have simplified standard treatment regimen levels at the national level. One of the things that enabled us to... to train nurses to prescribe ARVs was having a WHO recommended regimen one for antiretrovirals and then a regimen two. And very simple management algorithms for who goes on to regimen one, who goes on to regimen two. And we're going to be equipping nurses to manage these common diseases. We need to have algorithms to help them to manage it step by step and simplified standard treatment regimens. So they choose from this regimen or that regimen makes it much simpler to provide this thing at a primary care level. But the other thing that schools of health need to do to support primary care, as I've mentioned already, is to support the provision of in-service training modules 
to continually update our mid-level healthcare workers in the workforce. Not everybody can come and do a postgraduate one year full time to train as a primary healthcare nurse. It simply isn't, you're not going to get to all of the nurses and nurse assistants and pharmacy assistants and lay health workers that you need to get to. So schools of health need to look at how can we design in-service small modules, online modules, that people who are working full time can access these trainings. Next slide. And the last critical strategy is our public health response. And I think there are some basic things that we need to look at and some high level things we need to look at. An outbreak control at a community cl clinic level is one of the basic things. And there are a couple of very simple things that we need to do well at all our primary care clinics. And the one is good community surveillance. And a good example of that is to make sure that we have simple, robust TB registers that can easily slot into our national database. That's a very simple example. They're not difficult to run. They can be run by enrolled nurses. They can even be run by some lay healthcare workers. That's an example. We need to have good community surveillance of our common diseases. We tend to think of this only for infectious diseases, but there's also value for having surveillance of some of our non-communicable diseases. And the other thing that I think at a basic community clinic level is to have good knowledge and good practice of basic clinic level infection control measures. Now we've seen the value of this with COVID. Our clinics, all of our clinics, all of our healthcare workers at our clinics need to know and practice good respiratory infection control. And that includes hand and cough hygiene, cough triage, good ventilation. And I certainly saw how there were problems at a lot of our primary care clinics in the free state around TB, where clinics had windows that didn't open. Clinics had consulting rooms that didn't have windows and were poorly ventilated. Clinics were not uh, triaging people with coughs. Simple infection control around respiratory um, diseases. And we know that's important with TB, and we've seen this year how important that is with COVID. If our primary care clinics are practicing simple, effective respiratory infection control, it spills out into our community as well. And obviously also GRT and parasite infection control with good hand hygiene and good practices of food handling. These need to be basic things that are happening in all of our, with all of our healthcare workers at our primary care clinics. Next slide. At a higher level, I think we need to invest in teaching people epidemiological skills. Now, I don't have a master's in public health. I am not skilled in all these high level things. I dabble a little bit, but we need to have people that are confident to put together population level data on prevalence and incidence of common um, emerging diseases. That's critical. We need to have people that are skilled in outbreak investigation. We saw what happened in China with the emergence of COVID how critical it was to go and see what were the sources of this outbreak, isolate the sources of this outbreak. We've seen how important contact tracing skills are, and they make a difference in controlling an epidemic. We've seen what's happened with countries that are able to do contact tracing well. We've seen countries that should have been able to do contact tracing well and have completely fluffed it, like the USA and the UK. We've seen how important these skills are. These are high level public health skills and critical. And just an extra one that I know of, when in South Africa we had to try and roll out the antiretrovirals, we had to cope with these people high up in government who thought they weren't effective. And one of the things that made a difference was people who had good skills in assessing cost effectiveness. And they modeled the economic impact of not rolling out antiretrovirals compared to the impact of rolling out antiretrovirals. And it was clear that it was economically viable and absolutely critical to roll out ARVs in South Africa. These are high level epidemiology skills that are really critical. Next slide. So how do schools of health support public health training? Look, I think schools of health need to emphasize the importance of basic teaching on basic data collection and surveillance, you need teaching on a community approach to infection control. And these basic things should be done to all health workers. Obviously, in, in you know, increasing levels of complexity, lay healthcare workers need to know about basic data collection and infection control. But we need to teach this at the undergraduate level, 
and we need to teach this at a high level postgrad in things like the Masters of Public Health. Next slide. How else do schools of health support public health training? Subjects such as analysis of population level data, outbreak investigation skills, statistical skills, contact tracing, even cost effectiveness analysis. These are high level skills that are critically important. They should be taught to all of our healthcare workers. Obviously, the higher level healthcare workers, it's going to be postgrads doing things like a Masters of Public Health, but some of them can be taught to our lay health workers as well. And it needs to be either as part of a whole syllabus in public health, as part of our undergraduate or postgraduate degrees, but also looking at modular units, either online or in service. And I just want to make a plug here that postgrad masters of public health is a critical postgrad degree that will help us and, and train critical workers that will help us with um, epidemics in developing countries. Last, I think it's the last slide now. Okay, so I just want to reiterate, and this is my last slide. So the lessons for schools of health in public developing countries, three critical strategies, human resources, I've highlighted task shifting and, and clear policies around scope of work, there are others. I've highlighted the importance of the strong foundation of primary care. So I think we need to look at integrating services into primary care for common diseases. We need to look at the importance of community involvement. And lastly, we need to critically teach public health responses, um, both at a basic level, and a high level through things like the Masters of Public Health. And my last slide is a thank you slide. And I'll leave it open to questions. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh. So, untuk teman-teman yang mau bertanya gitu ya silahkan uh, bisa menulis di via chat via chat YouTube maupun via chat Zoom seperti itu atau yang ingin bertanya langsung silahkan uh, uh, angkat tangan di Zoom seperti itu so for those who want to directly ask to uh, Dr. Kerry uh, you can raise your hand or uh, you can also uh, write your a uh, question in the chat column in in YouTube and Zoom. Okay. So Okay. I have uh some question uh carry so based on the chat uh in the YouTube so I will I think just read one by one for you. So the first question is Okay. Uh in developing countries and then in the pandemic era, how can you prioritize the, the, the other health problem? So how can you make a precise priority? So uh, like, you know, we have other burden of disease as well. Not, not only this pandemic, we still, we still have the NCD, we still have the infectious disease, we still have the, the, the trauma as well. So how for us to this developing country to make the priority? This is the, the first question. Look, I think the first thing is you need good data of the impact of your uh, epidemic, your new epidemic. And that was one of the critical things in South Africa around um, HIV. And certainly, as we tried to implement this particular trial in the free state, and we said to the um, Department of Health Structures, district managers, clinic managers, nurses, uh, and we explained to them that we wanted nurses to take on HIV management one of the, the common uh, responses at first was, but we are so busy already and we are so understaffed, how are we going to take on this extra burden? And one of the ways in which we actually were able to do that was to point out, for instance, that the reason that they had so many TB patients was because there were so many people with HIV that were not getting on treatment. And if we could manage the HIV, we would decrease the TB burden. So I think one of the things that's really important to help speak to the health services about the importance is, is good data on the, on the numbers of people with the disease, the expected numbers of people with the disease, expected trajectories of the disease, um, you know, and, and, and that's high level data that you need. And that's why you know, something like a master's of public health is a critical um, degree in training in developing countries so that people are actually able to project what sort of numbers we're looking at 
when it comes to a disease. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's a okay. short answer. Okay, thank you, Kerry, for the answer. And then for the next question, uh, Mr. Saubur Setiaman, uh, you raise your hand. So now is your time to uh, ask to Kerry directly. Mr. Sobur. Yeah, any. Uh, Mr. Sobur. Hello. Okay, hello, Mr. Sobur. Okay, so. Uh... Okay, so because Mr. Sobur hasn't raised, okay, Mr. Sobur, so now it's your time to ask directly to, to Ms. Kerry. Okay. Okay, okay, so I think we will move to the next question uh, again. Uh, so later we will ask to uh, Mr. Sobur. Okay. So, uh, I think the similarity uh, between the HIV and then now about the COVID-19 pandemic is the denialism. So yeah. now in Indonesia as well, we can see some people still deny that the COVID-19 is still exists. And then like, I think like the healthcare worker and then the community and the like, like live in a different world. Like now healthcare worker is really struggle with the COVID-19 pandemic, but, but but the other people, uh, like the community itself, still doesn't really care about the COVID-19 pandemic and, and, and still deny about the pandemic itself. Okay, so. Hi, good morning. We... Okay, uh, okay, uh, Mr. Me... Sobur. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Kerry, so, okay. Uh, Mr. Sobur, so you want to ask now? Yeah, yes, I want to okay. ask you, just okay. you unmute uh, my uh, unmute, please. Uh, Ma'am, uh, good morning uh, from Qatar. I am the master student in the school. I want to ask you regarding the uh, early detection for uh, HIV and uh, uh, HIV detection and TB detection in uh, uh, South Africa as per your experience. Especially uh, new hire employment, they need uh, medical checkup included the, uh, that one. So if uh, discover that the candidate of employer get the positive HIP and TB in your experience in South Africa, this is, will be fit or unfit to work? Please, your experience. Um, Because in I, my experience here, Mr. my Sobo, experience here in Qatar, your new employer must be free from that case. I'm struggling to hear you. It might be better if you write your question down. It's very distorted, unfortunately. Are okay, you able to my put question, your question down and send it in? Uh, my question uh, about your experience in South Africa for uh, early detection uh, HIP and uh, TB case for a new hire for employment in some company. If uh, discover that the uh, new hire uh, got a positive HIP oh, or I'm TB, still, still will to be hired or uh, rejected? I'm still struggling to hear you. Um, it is distorted. It might be best if you write the question down. Okay, okay. I Sorry about down the, uh, What okay. I'm going to do, if you write that down and send that in, I'll try and answer it. The first, the, the question before that was around denialism. And I, I think you were right when you comment that one of the problems with COVID has been denialism. I think there are a couple of reasons that we see denialism. We see denialism when people are afraid and they are not sure what to do. So we saw a lot of denialism, for instance, amongst healthcare workers in South Africa who were themselves HIV infected. They were afraid of getting tested and it was difficult to get treatment. And so they denied it. They rather said, oh, it's not there. So I think one of the things that drives denialism in an epidemic is fear and ignorance. I think the second thing that drives denialism is poor leadership. And I think we see that very clearly in the USA. 
where there's been very poor leadership about COVID and a lot of denialism there as well. And I think the third thing is, is when, when responses to it are very centralised. So I think the way that we deal with denialism is we need clear leadership in the health sector, in the political sector, in the community sector, we need as many leaders as possible to give clear, unambiguous messages. The second thing we need to do, I think, is to, is to say clearly what things can be done. So maybe we don't have a vaccine yet for COVID, but wearing masks makes a difference. So let's wear masks. So before ARVs were available in South Africa, some of the clinics were set up where people could access cotrimoxazole to, present, to prevent one of the severe complications of HIV. And so you, you, you saw that people were doing something. It decreases the fear and it decreases the ignorance. And I think the other thing that helps to combat denial, denialism is to have services in every community. Because if the services are in every community, people are less likely to be afraid of that particular disease. That, that's, yes, that's just what I see as far as denialism is concerned. Yes, I understand. There are a lot of people uh, denial if there is has uh, suspected if, uh, with HIV or the TB. They need the uh, community involvement, how to encourage them to uh, get the medicine from the Premier Health Care Center. Yeah. And also, there is one thing problem in, in Indonesia uh, for the training uh, for nurses and uh, for the health care workers. There is no chance for the nursing school or uh, uh, school of health to import in the a train of them. Maybe the government doesn't want to share a uh, uh, finance for uh, developing uh, training for the healthcare workers. I think I saw a lot of uh, school in uh, London. There is a uh, offer a diploma certificate for the uh, yeah. tuberculosis for SIP. But in Indonesia, there is not available. There is a chance, I think, for the, the school to offer that uh, program. Look, I think I think you're quite correct. Um, you know, schools of health classically have trained people in the undergraduate where you get their degree or their initial nursing qualification, and they've offered postgraduate degrees where you study full time. But the, one of the real needs, as you say, is to be able to train nurses in their workplace and upskill them. And that's what we had to do in the Free State with the stretch trial. We had to upskill them in their workplace. And we did that with a manual and trainers that went to their clinic and they did one-hour sessions over a period of about six weeks. And that was training them just in HIV management. Uh, and so we need to look at models from the schools, and, and this has to come from the schools of health. How can we do in-service training? How can we offer small modules? How can we offer online training and offer certification so that people who are in the workforce are able to upskill? I think that's critical. Yes, ma'am. This is a good idea for this school uh, to offer that uh, program because the most uh, nurses and uh, pharmacy they need the short course. Not possible everybody come to school to get the master in public health no. <laughs> because very costly. I thought. Yep. Thank you for your thank, question. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, interaction with me. Actually, I'm a resident in Qatar. Most uh, lot of friends uh, here from South Africa, paramedic and doctor work with here. I work as the uh, nurse in a company in the Qatar. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, chatting with you. Okay, uh, Carrie, again, uh, I will talk about the denialism. So, like you said before, if we want to overcome the denialism, so we mm. have we need to have a strong leadership. Yes. So, so if we don't have the strong leadership, if we, if, if, uh, because, you will, uh, you what, will, because you will never get a perfect world where every leader does exactly what they're supposed <laughs> to do. Okay. And we've seen that. We've seen that in the yes. UK, we've seen that in the USA where there's been really poor leadership. But that doesn't mean that other people can't lead. 
Okay. Okay, so, so what happened in South Africa was that we eventually got a health minister that was a real leader and he led the rollout of ALDs into every primary care clinic. But before that, we had to get civic society to lead and they pushed them. So whatever level, whether it's leadership at the schools of health, whether it's leadership, local management, regional health facilities, the hospital, the leader of the hospital, the head of the nursing school, whoever's in a position of any leadership should lead about the importance of the response to this epidemic. It makes a difference. People should lead. They shouldn't just leave it up to one president. Imagine what a mess America would be in if it was only Donald Trump. Okay. Uh, you know, there are other decent leaders in America that are saying good messages around masks for COVID. And some people are listening. So, yes, I, I don't think we should just give up if we've got some bad leaders. There's plenty of people that can lead in their own little place, whether it's their hospital, whether it's even their clinic. I, I remember distinctly one of the hospitals in the Free State where the nurse who was looking after staff health took it on herself to be trained in ARVs and got every single staff member in that place tested for HIV and onto ARVs. She took it. She took leadership. And that that, that helped to, 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 to take down the fear and the denialism amongst the staff members in that particular hospital because one person took leadership. Leadership is important. Okay. If the government can act, we as a community can act. Okay, thank you, Kerry. So uh, the next question is from, from one of our lecturers, uh, Dr. Uh, Nuru Jayanti. The question is... Uh, now we are living in the technology area, uh, in in the technology era. So 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 how like the possibility or the or the opportunity that the technology will help us in to uh, prepare the pandemic or to respond to the pandemic? Um, look, I, as I said, I, I don't have a master's of public health, so I can't give you a comprehensive answer on that. I'm sure somebody would. Maybe you can do that. Marissa. You've got a master's of public health. But seriously, um, obviously data management is a big one and collecting data on, uh, for surveillance of the disease and collecting data on deaths, collecting data on the impact of the disease, that's where technology can help us a lot. I think the other obvious place where technology can help us a lot is um, exactly what's happening now. This is a Zoom meeting. We weren't doing this a year ago. Uh, so we've got, we've got online technology for training. We've got online technology for meetings. Uh, those are the things that, those are the obvious things. There, there must be many other opportunities. I'm afraid I'm not a great IT expert, but those are the ones I can think of. Okay. Thank you. So the next question is from one of our students, and, and, and I think... She uh, from Fabri Purti. Uh, uh, she very curious uh, why in the South Africa uh, the HIV infection is very high, yes. especially in young women and girls. All right. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. So now, obviously, what I was talking about was integrating HIV care into primary care in South Africa is relevant for South Africa because HIV is so common there. So integrating HIV care into primary care in Indonesia may not be the best strategy because it is not as prevalent, but it depends. You may decide in certain areas where it's very highly prevalent, that, so that's a useful thing to do. So that's my first comment. The reason why that worked in South Africa was because it was so common. And in fact, HIV is the commonest chronic disease. It is more prevalent than hypertension and diabetes in South Africa. And the question is why? Um, it's complex, but it's to do with social dynamics in South Africa. It's partly because of the, of the terrible disruption of black families in, in South Africa because of the legacy of apartheid over so many years. Families were torn apart. Um, but one, one of the reasons that it's happening is because there is more acceptance of multiple concurrent sexual partnerships than there is in other societies. So it is more likely in Southern Africa that people will have more than one 
sexual partner at the same time. And so you take a sexually transmitted disease, you put that into that social structure and it spreads much more rapidly. Um, and there also is, again, if you've got a, um, a disrupted families, you've got young girls and young women that are unemployed and poor, they are more susceptible to uh, um, older men coming along and buying sex, basically. And so that is one of the reasons why younger women have a much higher prevalence of HIV in South Africa. Okay. Another question? Oh, we, uh, you have to be patient, uh, Carrie. We have a lot of questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. The next question is from Amanda Cahya Yudi Sanjaya. So, uh, so she curious how to like manage stigma about uh, HIV within the health healthcare workers. So, so, so here, Carrie, uh, we have like a lot of uh, a lot of what is it experience when the healthcare worker when yeah. when he or she diagnosed with HIV they lose yes. their job. Okay. So, 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 so if the healthcare worker get infected with with HIV. In your opinion, how can we how can we manage it? The, okay. the stigma, the, the the discrimination. Okay, that that happens to be an area that is of great interest to me. Um, before I worked in the Free State, uh, so this was from 1998 up till 2006. I was working in Durban, on the coast, and that was working in one of the very 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 high prevalence areas for HIV. So in some of those areas in the antenatal clinics, in the surveillance monthly, 48% uh, of women were HIV positive. So very, very high prevalent area in Durban. And the hospital that I was working in, I was working as a, a general practitioner for the staff. And uh, we understood from surveys that had been done that up to 20% of our staff could well have been HIV infected. And most of that infection was community acquired rather than hospital acquired through needle stick injuries. And there was a lot of stigma about it. And we actually set up a, um, a service where they could access HIV care through myself as a GP. And I think the clues to decreasing stigma amongst healthcare workers is making services available, holistic and confidential. So it's not going to do any good if the staff have to go through to an ARV clinic because that automatically labels them. But if you, if you provide HIV care as part of a general service to your staff in a staff clinic, for instance, then they could be going to the staff clinic for a swollen ankle, or they could be going for an HIV test, or they could be going for a blood pressure check. Nobody knows. So it made it confidential. It made, and that's what we did at that particular hospital. I was the staff GP. And we said to the staff, they could access HIV testing, um, ARVs, the whole comprehensive HIV service and any other services at that clinic. So when they went to the clinic, nobody knew what they were going for. And, and we, we changed the whole attitude towards um, HIV testing amongst the staff simply by providing a service that was accessible. It was on the premises. It was accessible during working hours. It was confidential and it was comprehensive and it made a huge difference. So we wrote that up and published that in the SAMJ in uh, 20, oh, when was it now? Can't remember. If someone wants to Google my name, Ubel, um, you'll find something on that. And we also reported that in the Journal of Infectious Diseases. What do you need to do to improve access to HIV care for health, infected healthcare workers? The next question. Uh, I want to share, a sister. Okay, okay. Uh, now it's your turn, yeah, yeah. uh, Mr. So uh, Mr. Sobur. Yes, uh, my experience. No, I have a nursing license in Qatar. Every two years, there is a serology test uh, for HIV and uh, this one, HIV and uh, hepatitis B. If pondered uh, the positive, hundred percent in Middle East will lose of the nursing license. That's why you must be, be careful for those nursing students who don't started practicing 
in the hospital must be implemented infection control. In the Middle East, will be lose of the nursing license if you got the positive HIV and hepatitis B. This is my experience. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. F uh, Sobor, for sharing your experience. Okay. The next question uh, is about, okay, so because we are in developing country, we are lack of funding. So, so, so how could you handle with the, with the economic and then, and then, and then, and then the funding based on, based on your experience, Harry? This is an interesting question because you obviously do need funding. But I think one of the things that we forget is that one of our most important resources in a country is always going to be the human resources. So you can have hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you don't mobilise your human resources, that hundreds of thousands of dollars will go down the drain. So I think we need to emphasise how important are our human resources and support them. That, does, you know, that doesn't mean you, you, you don't need money, but you do need to be strategic about the way you use your money. Um, and, and like I say, I mean, there are interesting examples from that point of view. It's very expensive to train doctors, but if you're going to lose some of your doctors to, to the USA, why don't we actually put more priority on training mid-level healthcare workers? We need to be smart with the way we use our money, with what resources we've got. But again, I would say your best resource I think you're still muted. Okay. 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 Uh, Carrie, so this will be uh, the last question, maybe. So, the, okay. 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 I guess that's just, um, okay. I'll try it. Okay. So, uh, do you have any opinion? Uh, is, is, the question is from our students. So do you have any opinion how we, as a student, uh, uh, as, as, as a health school student, uh, how to educate our friend, how to educate the community without making it offensive to other people? Okay, <laughs> that is the question, Kerry. Do you have any opinion? Very good question. Um... I think I can only give the example of HIV. Mm. I think if we are involved ourselves in managing HIV or interacting with patients who have HIV or you can talk about working with patients with COVID, um, if we are actually doing that ourselves and we're doing that safely and we're doing that with compassion, that makes a big difference to the people that we know. Um, I think, again, we need to be looking at some of the basic things. So, for instance, when it comes to COVID, there are people that, that, that don't want you to wear masks and you want to know, and I think we can just simply explain why we are wearing masks and we can simply explain, yeah, sure, it might not be 100% effective, but it does make a difference. And I'm prepared to wear a mask because I want to protect other people. Now, that makes a difference. If you see someone that says, this COVID is spread by people coughing or talking in the air and I can breathe it in, sure, I'm wearing a mask to protect me, but I'm wearing a mask to protect you. That changes the whole dynamic. They can see then that you are doing something to protect the community and it makes a difference. People are more willing to listen if they see that what your actions are about are about protecting and helping other people. So I, I think it's the same with, with HIV. Um, you know, there, there was a lot of stigma about HIV. There's a lot of judgment around HIV. People who get HIV are sometimes seen as dirty or loose morals or all sorts of judgments around people who have HIV. But if you're involved in getting treatment to people who have HIV and you're actually helping them and treating them just as normal human beings, 
it makes a big difference to the attitude of other people towards it. They see that you yourselves are actually being compassionate to other people. It makes a difference. Okay. I Thank saw you. there was a comment in the chat and I wasn't sure that I understood it correctly from Dr. Sentot. Okay. We want your advice if the case of HIV and chronic disease oh, diabetes. Okay. Um, would, would that person like to unmute and try and put the question again? Because I wasn't sure that I understood it. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so kepada Mr. Sentot tadi, uh, apa namanya, uh, silahkan mengirimkan kembali pertanyaannya seperti itu. Uh, kami tunggu seperti itu. Jadi uh, tadi Kerry menyampaikan, uh, Dr. Kerry menyampaikan seperti itu. Agar kami lebih paham begitu. Okay. Hello, I'm not sure that I understood your question. Mm -hmm. Can you try and, and phrase it again? Okay. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in your institution, now you must be uh, have a uh, funding to research and HIV incident uh, with uh, chronic disease. If you have a uh, much uh, funding, maybe we want we want to uh, MOU with your institute to research. And localized in Kediri. What you are the com? Okay. All right. I will try. I'm not sure I understand the question completely, but you're asking about funding through our institution. Um, personally, at the moment, I am mostly a teacher. Yes. I am not involved in a lot of research. I, and in fact, I'm not actually working with HIV and TB at the moment. I'm primarily a teacher of undergraduate medical students. I yes. am in the School of Population Health, but I'm not teaching much into population health. And I personally am not doing any research into uh, uh, chronic diseases like uh, diabetes and, uh, and, and TB. So I, I actually can't give you any real advice about funding uh, for these, but except to say that I know that diabetes and hypertension are very, very important non-communicable diseases that are becoming much more prevalent in developing countries like South Africa and I believe probably Indonesia as well. And it is critical to be doing research on the impact of these diseases, the best way to manage these diseases, um, and for schools of health, for instance, to be putting together things like standardised treatment regimens that are simple to roll out across primary care facilities and putting together things like um, standardized, clear, simple, step-by-step -step management guidelines that can be used by people like primary care nurses. So that's from a, from a treatment point of view. And the other research that needs to be done really is looking at your population level uh, impact of these non-communicable diseases. But um, as I said, I'm not involved in these research projects or in funding of these, so I don't have much of a clue there. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the second question for you, uh, yes. Dr. Kerry, uh, about leadership. Uh, your research in Africa, North Africa or South Africa, uh, the important leadership is must to go uh, successful to uh, treatment HIV, and I want you compare uh, leadership in Africa uh, with my country. Unfortunately, I can't compare leadership in South Africa with your country because I'm not aware of the leadership in your country. Yes. But I'm guessing that like any developing country, there yeah. are examples of good leadership and there are examples of bad leadership. Because yeah. I certainly saw that in South Africa, and I believe it would be the similar in Indonesia. And yeah. all I can say is um, the best way to counter bad leadership is to be a good leader yourself. 
<laughs> and to lead and make good decisions in your own sphere of inference, however small or big it is, that the things that we do as individuals actually impact people around us. Yes, if, um, and, and the next, if you recommend recommended uh, uh, leadership as the, the most uh, priority to decrease uh, high fear incident, and how? How do you do? Uh, That's a very difficult one. There is a lot of leadership around um, HIV in South Africa at the moment, and yet you saw from my statistics that the number yeah. of people living with HIV is going up and the prevalence is going up. But remember, those stats are affected by two things. There are two things that contribute to increasing numbers. The one is new infections, but the yeah. other one is treating people so that they survive. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so the more people you get on treatment, the more people survive. And so therefore the number of people living with the disease does go up. There, there are real issues around leadership and, and HIV. Um, and I don't think it's a, it's a short-term solution. I think with something like COVID, which is such a short, acute illness, we'll see effects uh, in much shorter time. I think with something like HIV, which is such a long infection, um, we're only going to see the impact of good leadership over the period of like 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. Okay. And the last, my question to Dr. Kerry, I want your recommended or your analyze uh, what's the, uh, what's the important uh, to decrease incident high fare leadership or funding? Uh, funding is important, but it's not the number one importance. The thing that will decrease incidence of HIV is changing community behavior. There yeah. are two countries in Africa where they've demonstrated massive decreases in HIV incidence. And those two countries were Uganda and Zimbabwe. And okay. Uganda decreased incidence significantly in, 19, in the 1990s, and that was very strong leadership from the president yeah. and encouraged everybody to be tested. Oh. In Zimbabwe, the thing that made a difference was that the government was falling apart. Yeah. Zimbabwe was slipping into chaos, and communities themselves actually realized that if they didn't yeah. change their behaviors, they were going to die. Yeah. And literally what happened was communities themselves mobilized, particularly amongst men, to change their behavior, their sexual behavior, so that they stopped having multiple partners and instead had one partner at a time. And that made a huge difference. So it was a community-driven change in behavior. That is the number one thing, actually. Leadership and community changes in behavior that oh. will lead to decreases in, in HIV incidence. Yes, yes, it's okay. okay. It's, uh, not, it's not primarily funding, although funding is always important. That's not number one. Uh, not number one. It's, uh, leadership is number one, maybe, yeah? Leadership, leadership is important, but yeah. community mobilization and okay. community changes are critical. Three angels to decrease HIV. The first yeah. is uh, <laughs> leadership, yeah. the yeah. second is communication, And the yeah. third may be uh, funding. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot. And Very happy well. for you, uh, Dr. Okay. Kerry, from you. me in Indonesia. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, okay. okay. Kerry, we still have questions, actually, but we're running out of time. So, uh, the next agenda, I think, will be closing statement from our counselor, maybe just five minutes five minute closing statement. Uh, so now uh, to Prof. Sandu Sioto, now it's your turn. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Reza, our lecturer, also our appreciation, Master International Public Health and Specialist, the best record, For Mrs. Dr. Kerry Ubel, I am Sandu Sioto. I am president of Strada Institute of Health and Sciences. 
I am pleasure and sign this morning as rector, Mr. Sandu, always follow and observe with your performance, Mrs. Dr. Oibel. Thank you very much. Big hopefully, not only in this moment, but be continued in the next moment, the first time. Honorable Dr. Kerry Ubel, Strada Head and uh, Strada Institute and Sciences, now have 14 major diploma, bachelor, and postgraduate, especially Magister of Public Health and Master of Nurse. Now, Strada Indonesia Institute of Sciences. I want to know information, Mrs. Dr. Harry Kerry Obel, Honorable. Strada also become member of Asia Pacific Public Health Academic Consortium, APEC. And formerly, Strada have accepted to become member at Maidol University. And the last, Big hopefully, between Strata Indonesia Health and Sciences and New South Wales can collaboration, research together, and of course, Strata want to invite lecturer from New South Wales to become guest lecturer. In other that, our spirit to go international can be achieved. Honorable Dr. Obel, Strada also big hopefully. After pandemic COVID-19 is over, the group of Strada, especially master program, can visit your university to benchmarking to by its collaboration, also memorandum of understanding and memorandum of acceptance, even to double degree, if possibly. Of course, still discuss furthermore. The last, because Strada Indonesia senses have branding for G, although from the little city, but, but we have the big dream Mrs. Kerry uh, Hobel. One more, big hopefully this agenda can be useful to all participants. And for information for you, that moment have been following around 200 more participants from diploma after and uh, until postgraduate. Thank you very much. Big hopefully we can see you again in the best situation. Good morning. Bye bye. Good morning. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very uh, much. Thank, okay. Thank you very much. So the next agenda, jadi agenda selanjutnya adalah penyerahan sertifikat seperti itu uh, kepada yang bertugas dipersilahkan. So now the agenda is. Uh, we want to show our appreciation for you, Kerry, to to come and uh, share your very valuable insight about how should we uh, School of Health uh, respond to the uh, the current epidemic. So uh, your presentation and your insight is uh, very valuable. Uh, really, I want to come to Sydney and hug you, actually. <laughs> I miss Sydney very much. Okay. Uh, once again, uh, thank you, Kerry, for coming and then share your insight, your knowledge. And then uh, we will end this session. We will end this meeting. So uh, for those participants, now you can leave this meeting. Okay, Risa, maybe uh, yeah. uh, from Kerry Ubel when the special message to me, to us. Okay, give okay. Opportunity to uh, Ms. Dr. Kerry. Okay, so, okay, sorry. Uh, so before you, 
uh, exit. Uh, so, so before you go go out from this chat, could you please say something, Harry? Uh, something too. Huh? Do you want to say something? Um, I just want to say thank you very much to uh, Strata for the invitation and for the involvement here. I appreciate that uh, that welcome, and it was very good to um, hear your questions and try and give some insights. And I hope that they were helpful insights. And it was lovely to join you, and it's lovely to see Reza again after so many months. Okay. I really want to. I really come. Uh, so uh, now, are you at 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 campus in SW or or are you at home? No, I'm still at home. We're still not on campus. Okay. I really yeah. want. I really want to come to Sydney and hug you, Kerry. Oh, I really ah, miss you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. So. Uh, you, yeah. Okay. What about Okay. okay. Okay, so, uh, okay, uh, thank you uh, once again. Thank you very much for for you, Kerry, to come and share, share very very valuable insight. So now, uh, the this international web webinar will be is end. So so now all of the participants can exit or can end this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Risa. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye, Dr. Carroll. Bye-bye. Okay.